Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Britain's last lion tamer is planning to apply for a licence to tour England this summer, despite a government pledge to ban the use of wild animals in travelling circuses. Thomas Chipperfield's family has been training circus animals for around 300 years. Joined by the trainer himself, Thomas Chipperfield, and also director of Peter uh, Eliza Allen. Hello to you both. Thank you very much indeed for joining us on Sky News this afternoon. Eliza, you go first. Why is it a bad idea? You know, it is obscene that in 2008 that we still have to have this conversation. Most people understand that animals are not objects of ridicule. They are not ours to use, to abuse, to exploit for the sake of entertainment. Uh, in the UK, every animal protection group in this country, including the British Veterinary Association, recognized that animals' complex needs can simply not be met in a circus environment. Over 90% of respondents to government consultation on the issue support a ban, and yet here we are, it's 2018, it's time for the government to stop dragging its heels and to follow suit as Scotland, as Ireland, as Italy have done and uh, take decisive action to ban these cruel, archaic institutions. Okay. Thomas, there you go. Your response to that? Well, very firstly, uh, I, d I don't wish to start with an ad hominem, but I think it's important to know where my fellow guest is coming from. Peter is a fanatical group that has alleged financial links to terrorism, which supports its Whoa. cause, uh, supports Stop pseudoscience. Right no, 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 just one second. This is stuff that's been Thomas, extensively Thomas, reported. Thomas, 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 that's your view and uh, not that of Sky no, no, or no, any other. Do you want to talk about lion taming or occasions. not? It has been... It has been reported on numerous occasions. Okay, do you want to talk about lion taming so or not? If you could just let me finish for one second. Do you want to talk about lion taming or not? No, I'm responding to the claims made by my fellow guest. If you would give me the chance to, I'd like okay, to do that. Okay, let me just put this out there. If you talk about terrorism again, you, we're going to have to say goodbye. Up to you. What do you want to say? I'm just saying that's what's been reported in the past. I'm allowed to say that. No, you're not. Am it, I not? No, you're not. It's so, untrue, Thomas. Uh, hold on. Doesn't matter, really. I, I'm in charge of this programme. Thomas, what do you want to say about lion taming? Right, OK, well, then I'll just move directly to the points Go on, then. made by my fellow guest. There is no ban going on in Italy. That's... Uh, and I hate to use this term, but it is fake news. It's just not happening at all. There's no documentary evidence for that whatsoever. And in regards to the British Veterinary Association, they themselves have not carried out any scientific studies into this matter. They've based their opinion on a review that has been proven to have been set up. People whose work has actually contributed to this review, to this review, so sorry, have stated that their data was distorted 180 degrees. OK, why do you want to tame lions out of interest? Why do you want to tame lions? Can I, can I just... Can I talk about public opinion no, quickly? No, no, you can answer the questions. That's how this works. Do you, why well, do you want to tame lions? I'm responding to the points that... Do I'm, you I'm want to tame to lions? Why do you guests? want to tame lions? Oh, goodness me. Lies, do you want to come in while I try and figure out how we're going to deal with this? Uh, why do you <laughs> yeah. think that people no, want to see lions being tamed? Lies. Well, the fact is that they don't. As I said, uh, over 90% of respondents to a government consultation in this country support a ban on wild animal circuses. And you know what? That makes sense. It is, frankly, obscene to deny animals their freedom, to tour them up and down the country, cart them around and force them to perform demeaning, silly and painful tricks for the sake of human entertainment. There are countless ways that we can entertain ourselves today that don't involve exploiting okay. and harming animals. Okay, let Thomas come back and that way you go, Thomas. Okay, public opinion. DEFRA found that 6,000 residents of the UK supported a ban. It's not 95% of the British public. 6,000 British residents responded to that. Scot Scotland, with their own public opinion poll, got 1,000 residents. The Welsh Assembly got less than 900. And to, um, to counter that, there were actually 53,000 signatures in a petition 
to have yourself, Miss Burley, dismissed from your position at Sky oh, News in response me. to your handling What's of the Nick Barney <laughs> interview. OK, well done. You've done your research. So Why do you want to tame lions? Because I enjoy working with these animals and they actually enjoy doing it as well. All the scientific no, data that exists don't. supports that. Don't be ridiculous. Get... Lions want to run at 50 a... miles an you... hour, you... don't they, are along you... the savannah? They don't want to be whipped and tamed in a from ring. An area... Are you are you ex are you speaking from a position of expertise or I not? I know quite a lot about lions, yeah. Well, you obviously don't know enough. I and know I quite a lot about lions, I think yeah. As your no, I'm sorry, but I do have to say this: as a de facto moderator of this debate, it's your duty to be impartial, and you're not fulfilling that duty. I'm asking you. I'm playing devil's advocate. I'm asking you to answer questions which you're not doing. All you're doing is you're being abusive to, both to me and, and to my fellow guests, which fellow I'm not going to tolerate. I'm sorry, what was that last point? I said you're being abusive to my fellow guest. You're raising issues that are not... Yeah, you were. All. Yeah, you were. I'm asking... And I also, wasn't being abusive. Also, I'm asking you why you feel that lions... Stories. OK, I'll come back to you when I can get a word in age ways. Uh, Elias, uh, he, he has a point. People do go and watch lions being tamed. They do want to go and see animals in circuses. It's not for you to tell the greater public what they should and shouldn't be doing. You know, it's a very, very small minority of people who still think that it is acceptable to deny animals their freedom, their liberty for the sake of entertainment. As I said, today, most ca compassionate people around the world recognize that animals are simply not ours to exploit for the sake of entertainment. And that's what this comes down to. For Thomas and other animal abusers, the writing's on the wall. The momentum is on our side. We're seeing governments around the world ban these institutions. And it's only a matter of time before the government in England and Wales does the same. OK. Thomas, you're an animal abuser, we're told by Petter. Yeah, are you going to uh, rush to my defence on that one, Miss Burley? I'm going to ask you to answer that the question. Do you want to abuse, answer the question? Not? Well, there's no scientific evidence whatsoever to suggest that myself or any other competent animal trainer is actually abusing their animals at all. It's not based on any scientific understanding of animals. OK, do you think this that your from... lion or lions enjoy what happens to them? Well, according to all of the uh, vets and zoo consultants that I speak to, their well-being hasn't suffered for it in any way whatsoever. OK, do, my question was, do you think they enjoy it? I do find that they are actually very happy and comfortable in their work. Yes, I do. And, and how do they show that to you? Through positive displays of uh, behaviour. Um, Give me an example. Well, emotional behaviour, I would say. Give me say. an example. Sorry? Give me an example. Example. Friendly behaviour, such as... Um, Verbal, um, friendly verbal expressions, the like um, an eagerness to maintain close physical contact with myself and the like. I'm guessing that's not because they want to eat you. I don't know, Elias, why do you... So, you know, there you go. They are enjoying themselves. They're showing uh, behaviour towards Thomas where they want to be close to him. They seem relaxed. The vets are saying that they're relaxed. Again, you know, if, if that's the case, what's your problem? Uh, I, I don't know who Thomas is speaking to. Every, as I said at the beginning, every single animal protection group, every animal welfare expert in this country agrees that a wild animal's complex needs cannot be met in a circus environment. Uh, of course, Thomas okay. has a vested interest in defending his business. He is exploiting animals for profit, okay. and we should we should re uh, remember that. We started that. with you, so we must finish with Thomas. Final word to you, Thomas. OK, well, um, again, you can say I have a vested interest in this, but the animal rights industry is worth millions and millions and millions around the world. And my fellow guest is actually wrong to say that all animal welfare experts in this country or anywhere else agree with her. That's okay. just not the case whatsoever. OK. OK, it's good to talk to both of you. Final point on clarity, though, Thomas. It was actually 60,000 people who signed that petition for me to get sacked. I'm still here. Good to talk to you. Thank you. Another Simon in Brixton. Hello there. You disagree, don't you, Simon? Hello, yes, I do. I think it's sort of deeply immoral, really, to have more than two children. We live on a planet deeply of... Deeply immoral? <gasps> yeah. I must tell my mum. Well, um, you know, back then maybe things are different, but let's face it, we have contraception now. And um, I think it's a really good thing that the government said, look, yeah, you can have as many children as you like, but we're not going to pay for any more 
than two. The child maintenance allowance is just for two children to discourage people. So if you have more, more than, than two, two children, do you have to... Let, let's extrapolate your idea. If you have more than two mm. children, do you have to pay for their education as well at the local state school? Uh, it's not so much to me about the money. The fact is we do live on a planet of finite resources. In the past, we solved overpopulation in the UK by colonising America and Africa and Australia at the expense of the people there. In China, they had mass famine when they had overpopulation. Then they introduced the one-child rule, and now they don't have mass famine anymore. It's a really big issue, and I think people just sort of sweep it under the carpet. And the vasectomy idea, that has been used successfully in India. They give people cash payments and willingly, or football tickets and things like that, and people don't want to have more children. They're a burden. And they take it up, and the population... Well, you uh, can't in, say, you, you can't say for certain that everybody thinks their child is a burden. How do you know? When did they tell no. you that? Not, 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 not everyone, but in lots of countries and for lots of people, having lots of children is an economic burden, not only on the, on the environment, but on people's lifestyle. If everyone had two children, there'd be more resources. And you don't think, but you don't think, you don't think the manner in which we consume our resources has, uh, it can be looked at. I mean, even, even that recent report that showed how little, for example, of the UK is built up. You know, the, the, the picture that, that you and others paint of the UK is of it bursting at the seams with people, literally no space, nowhere to grow any more carrots. Ah, we're all going to starve if we keep having children. It's nonsense. Well, it's not because every person needs a few acres of land for the food and the water. One person doesn't just take up a square metre. Every person requires a number of acres. I'm not saying... I'm not, and I think the issue is confused because the, the Nazis decided who should breed and then ethnic cleansing was used as an excuse to reduce population. No, no, no. Like, charities like Population Matters and these groups, so they want people to be softly encouraged to just have two children. I mean, paying for vasectomies, I mean, really, why not? It's not a fascist thing. It's softly, a hang thing. on, hang on. There mm. was an, uh, softly encouraged. Uh, mm. Let me remind you of his words at the time. If we don't do this, it'll mean uh, we'll be drowning in a vast sea of unemployed wasters that we pay to keep. That's not soft encouragement or an intelligent conversation about family planning, both of well, which are fine conversations to have. That's well, That's almost... Almost, you said the N word before me, it's almost eugenics. I don't think it is, and I think a lot of people are seeing that the most intelligent, hard-working and educated people are not having children, they're putting it off, they're just having one or even not at all, whereas the sort of the less intelligent people on oh. the side who are dependent are oh. having more children. So, you, so you're <laughs> equating the number of children you have with intelligence? It often is the case that the poorest, often, most sometimes. stupid smoke, mm. smokers are having more and more children than the more intelligent stupid people in society. Smokers. It's the opposite of evolution in a way, isn't it? It's the, the least intelligent people in society having more children. You can see it everywhere. Most intelligent, educated everywhere. people just have two. It's everywhere. If you go through the, the poor places in Brixton, it's always people with big families who often don't work that have the most children. Why? What, have you, what research have you done? Have you stood there counting them, speaking to them, getting their names and addresses, seeing how many more children they have? It's anecdotal. It's oh, anecdotal. yeah, I thought it might be. Simon, thank you for your call anyway. Kevin in Manchester, hi. Hello there. Well, Hello. The previous, callers, the previous callers far more articulate than I could ever be there. I agree with him 100%. I mean, it's irresponsible to have more children than you can afford to support, or the state can afford to support and clothe and feed. I mean, look at parts of the world where uh, the birth rate is unrestricted. You've got the Philippines. Uh, due to the Catholic religion there, there are children in abject poverty. They're living in cardboard boxes, under motorways. There's parts of South America, same again. Abject poverty, living in squalor and shanty towns, when the birth rate is unrestricted. Um, you've all parts of Africa. I mean, there are parts of the world where poverty is rife, and it's and the and the people carry on having massive families. And uh, very but, often, but do you accept? To, do you accept? Don't do the Catholic religion in many cases. Oh, terrible Catholics. Well, no, well, I'm, I'm not saying, Carol, you say that, but, oh. but it's a reasonable, it's a reasonable thing to say, I mean, the... the, the, the Sorry, I thought it was the Muslims outbreeding oh, us. That's oh. the latest claim of people who Sorry. worry about, uh, the, uh, the, the, the people who worry about how many children people are having and are normally blaming the Muslims. Have we, have we gone back to blaming the Catholics? No, I'm not blaming the Catholics. I'm blaming the Catholic religion that tells people not to use contraception. In, this, in the 21st century, that's quite ridiculous, in my opinion. 
And, and to the UK, where most people, Catholics included, ignore that advice and use contraception, what, what now? Well, uh, if you were under, under, under a certain you, amount of money, you can't have a baby. Uh, well, no, it's it's not that. Well, it, it is. It is. You're saying that economics doesn't play a part, and I'm saying saying it plays a massive part. I didn't say it doesn't play a part. Uh, I said it shouldn't be the defining yes or no to whether a human being can decide to have a child or not. So you say a couple living on the minimum wage with one person working should be able to have eight children. If if they wish to, I think they should, and I think that society uh, 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 should... You reckon the, ta the taxpayer should support their, their uh, standard of life? The taxpayer and the, the government and government policy should, should support their chances in life, not dole out well, money to them. The, the There's a real difference to Oh, OK. Well, we're all going to hell in a handcart then, Kevin. Thank you. The government doesn't have any money. Kevin in Manchester. Daniel has called, has his third child on the way. Congratulations, Daniel. Thanks, Sheila. Uh, your thoughts on this will be very interesting for that very reason. <laughs> Far away. Yeah, no, I mean, I don't, you know, <laughs> I'd be a little scared this morning. I thought, he might, I thought he might have been coming a bit quicker than I thought. Oh. Um, <laughs> what, what I would say, though, is, is whilst, you know, whilst the responsible society... Um, you, Whilst there should be such thing as sort of child tax credit and things like that, I mean, it's nice and it, 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 is, it does help. But I do think to cap it at three, even though I'm having my third child, is fair. Because I think if you, if you take a step back and you look at, look at ev everything that, that you get, I mean, your child obviously gets, it gets born for, for free in the NHS, then goes to school, perhaps college for free till the age of sort of 17, 18, you know, you, you get you, you the amount that you pay in. You you probably never sort of will, will ever get back. And I but do you only? But that's the point, isn't it? You don't only pay in for yourself. I mean, I've I've paid in uh, enough taxation to warrant sending one of my children to school for all of its childhood. I don't have any children, so what, what do I get a rebate, or do I celebrate well, the fact that I live in a society where other people's children can benefit from that? Therefore, society benefits from that. Therefore, yeah. I benefit from that. Yeah, and I, I'm, I, I think that system, that's perfectly fine, Sheila, and, and, and very admirable. But I think there are, there are limits. And I think I pay, I've got two jobs to make ends meet, so my wife can have our children. Um, I pay two lots of NI as well. But, uh, so, uh, but I think there are limits to that. Why should the government pay, or why should we pay, for people to have four, five, six children in, yeah. in, in, in the, in the but, modern day? But Daniel, this isn't... this. if they can't afford it. There, there has to be a cap. And even though it affects me adversely... I'm happy that there's a cap, yeah? Right, that's on the child benefit aspect. What I'm asking about is, I mean, it's a valid part of the discussion, but, what, but, but the fundamental question that I'm asking about and the thing that makes me uncomfortable, I'm not especially uncomfortable with the child benefit cap. I mean, I, I, I'm not for it, but I can, I think it's arguable. You know, I don't agree with it, but I think it's arguable. What I'm chilled by is when people start saying not just plan your family differently because of economic reasons but but you poor people shouldn't have children uh, that there are that, you know and and the language that's used around poverty and and family size and it's just it's just really uncomfortable do you not feel do you not hear it the same way i hear it no of course i do and uh, you know of, of course i do but i, I look at I think he wrote that. Was it, uh, uh, nobody would disagree with you, Chief. That's the thing. Well, they and do. I think he probably wrote <laughs> Every that caller has. Sorry? <laughs> Every caller has disagreed with me. They think he's talking oh, sense. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think we, we all need to put into a system. What I do think, look, stop looking at the micro and look, take a step back and look at the macro. I think lots and lots of people in this country want something for nothing. We don't put enough away for our old age and then we moan that the pension is not enough. Um, there's, there's, you know, I think every sh everything should be means tested. I don't think, you know, let, let's give old people who really need winter fuel allowance more. And if you don't need it, don't take it. You know, we 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 need to get our pride back. And ditto child, child allowance. allowance. Or oh, it's not called that anymore, is it? Child benefit. There are clearly no, families I mean, that do not I, need I, it. I mean, everything needs to be means tested. If 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 you're an old person and you've got quite a lot of money and you don't need winter fuel allowance. Do not take it. Leave some money in the pot for someone who really does. Is there if any well is there any universal benefit that you wouldn't remove? Um, I think you have to have you have to have all the NHS and and these kind of benefits there for. I mean, I could probably. But I, I could pay a hundred quid a month for private health care. I could pay. Two hundred quid a month for private health care, probably. Um, yeah, so should I, I sh should I not use the NHS, or, sh or should we value 
a service that we have for all, for the common good? Well, this is it. We, we should. We, it does need to be valued. For we, you, you pay into the system, maybe not for yourself, but you pay. You pay in a lot of the time for the people that can't pay for themselves. I mean, we probably a two thirds of society would probably be better and have a better healthcare if we paid our own. But the same in America, two thirds of people would be better off paying their own. But you've got that one third or one quarter of people that can't afford it, and they'd be worse off. So you end up developing a system like ours for the people that can't help themselves. And is three your limit now of children? Have you got reasons for that that are financial or to do with the planet or just because your wife doesn't want any more? Or what's what, what are you, what's your plan? Well, uh, to be honest with you, Sheila, my plan is to go and get a vasectomy. <laughs> um, because, That's fantastic. Uh, that call has made my day full circle. Yeah, I mean, my daughter's four, my son's two, and I've got another boy on the way. And it's, it's really lovely, you know, there are two sides you've got. A wonderful but family. enough already is your, is your take. I'm very happy, but my hair's turning grey. Okay. I'm ageing at a rate of knots. Yeah. You know, yeah. But enough's enough. You and know? what if the government said you uh, not had to have, but should have a vasectomy at that point? Um, would that feel like an intrusion too far? Well, of course. You can't go around telling people, rich or poor, they have to have a vasectomy. You know, at, at three kids, no one had to tell me, Sheila, I'm booking straight in. Okay. Good luck with it, Daniel. Thank you. I'll send you the photos. Do, do send us photos. And best of luck with the delivery as well with the birth. Thank you. Not that it's going to be any hard work for you, but Daniel and Epsom, thank you very much indeed. I enjoyed that call. Just before we speak to Mark in Leicester, let's read some of these texts you've been sending. Why should taxpayers pay for irresponsible people to, people to breed as much as they want? Um, I love the way people use the word breed in this context. Uh, no problem if they can afford to, but not the taxpayer funding them. Uh, come and look at some of the streets around where I live in the northwest. There are people who have no intention of working. It's all very well, Sheila being so PC as to shudder at the thought of the economic value of an individual. Uh, if someone has never worked, what makes them think taxpayers should pay to raise their kids. I also suggest the assistance your parents got was an awful lot less than these scroungers get now. Ben Bradley did not say you can't have a child. He's saying the amount should be capped. That's all. Well, he did talk about a sea of wasters. That was from Sue, uh, who thinks I'm being a Pollyanna about this. I know what Ben is talking about. He's not talking about you. He's talking about people who don't want to work. He's not talking about working class. He's talking about underclass. Well, that's terribly reassuring. Yes, you are being Pollyanna. You want to get into the real world. I really do. Uh, let's hear from Mark in Leicester. Hello there, Mark. Hello, Sheila. How are you? I'm OK, I think. Yeah. yeah, you're a lovely lady. and You're coming at it from a really wonderful point of view. But my experience, my direct experience, is my daughter-in-law's sister has had three children with three separate fathers. She's had the third one this year purely to move house because she wants a bigger house. And she has a friend who lives down the road who's had four children with two fathers. She had the fourth one so she could get into a four-bedroom property. So when we talk about the economic drain on the state... Um, from my point of view, we shouldn't be just talking about the direct cost of children. I have two children. I have two wonderful boys. My, my eldest son's married. I have a wonderful granddaughter. Uh, me and my wife, when we had ours, she didn't get child benefit. She had to leave work and I had to do 12-hour shifts. Um, there was loads of work around in that time, so we managed to do it. And the mortgage was nowhere near as high as it is now. But from for, for what the politician said, which is completely wrong, he 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 wants his, his his mouth actually ringing out with soap and scrubbing because what he said was wrong. But there has to be a balance. And coming from your loving side, I don't have an issue with that. What I have an issue with more than anything is I know people who use the system, and the system doesn't then turn around and do things to actually make them responsible. So the fathers don't pay anything into this. We do as taxpayers, and that's got to be wrong, surely. She's not getting any support from any of those three, four different fathers, no? No, not, they're not even. And the thing about it, if you talk to her, she won't even want them to pay in because she doesn't want them to have any pull on those children. She wants to run her life in the way that she wants it. And me and you as taxpayer are paying for that. My my local authority 
um, poll tax is paying for the property, and then she'll be getting other things, like when she got this new child, she got but a do, new pram. Yeah, but do we judge... Do, do, I take your point, but do we judge uh, the system? Do we shape the system around genuine need and genuine common good? I would say yes, we do. Or do we judge the system based on those who abuse it? No, what, no we, we need to do it around common good. But where it is being abused, there has to be a sanction. Yeah, I agree. And I, and I, and I think but, that's but, where but, but, but. we need to have the adult conversation. I agree. And, and I think the sanction uh, needs to... You, you need to be careful with the sanction. With, with what it is, and you need to make sure that sanctioning, uh, of in whatever format it comes, doesn't harm the child. Because you have to, the state and the parent, both need to protect and encourage and allow the child to thrive. If the parent isn't, the state has to help them do that. So the state sanction shouldn't be harming the child, should it? No, and I and and I agree with that. But if you're in a situation where the parent is literally turning around and saying, "I'm all right, Jack." I'm getting my money up yours, then what do you do? Because that's the thing that you're not really addressing. You're not addressing the people who are focused on, I can get this money, I know how to do it, I'm going to use the system. But how many are? How do? many? I, I mean, neither of us knows the answer to this, but I would ask, no, and, no. I, and I, how many people are doing that compared to the numbers of people whose families yeah. do thrive but, but because should, of the existence of a tax-payer-funded state support should, system. Why should the good, let's say it's 5% or 3%, either you, you pick a number, right? it's going to be 2 or 3% or 1% or whatever. Why should the many have to, have to fork out for people who are using the system in, in a way that is detrimental, one, to the system, and two... To, to everybody who pays into it. There has to be a sanction. And, and until we can agree that the sanction needs to be put in place, and that bit might be on the parent doing, you know, um, 15 hours community service, it, you know, there's lots of things that can be done. It doesn't need to be a monetary thing. But you argue we just allow people to get away with those abuses of the system as you see them. Mark, thank you. Mark in Leicester. Will in Devon says people should only have children if they can support them financially. It's only responsible. Thank you, Will. Uh, James is called from Manchester to carry on our conversation about Calais, about security at the Channel border, the 40 plus million pounds we're expected to confirm, or the Prime Minister is expected to confirm, we will give to the French um, to boost that security at, uh, at Calais later on. Um, do we just simply have to do it, James, or do we have a choice? Hello, Sheila. Lovely show as usual. Thank you. Um, well, I'm very happy with the um, amount spent on security. I don't have a problem with that. But uh, uh, I, I was looking up the definitions of blackmail, um, and one of them is it's an act often criminal involving unjustified threats to make a gain, or another one, or cause loss to another unless a demand is met. Um, not so much your show, Sheila, by any means, but looking at the media and the internet and the news reports, I, I just I just wish we could call it out for what it is and stop all this sanctimonious, virtuous language that the deal has been met. Because really, it's basically blackmail. If we don't do it, it we'll threaten you with this, which is pretty much how the EU has behaved with us from the day that we voted for Brexit. Um, and I don't think it matters what deal we get, but I just wish people would call it out for what it is. But, is but, 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 if, let's, let's forget language for a second, let's just talk about facts, you know, n neither you nor I are Theresa May or, or Emmanuel Macron. If the fact is that many of those migrants would attempt to or succeed in getting to Britain, um, if, if the security wasn't tight enough in Calais, then doesn't it just serve us if, as a government, we've decided we want to take a firm hand, limit numbers, not have an open door policy to those people coming through to Calais for obvious reasons? Um, it, it, doesn't it just serve us to cooperate with the country in which those people are? 
it certainly serves us. And your earlier caller who mentioned that, um, that there is a very um, strict policy on applying for um, citizenship in the in, in the UK, which they could do in France, and he, he eloquently mentioned it. I think that's the way we need to be looking at them going. And, you know, nobody wants to see people dying. You'd have to be out of your mind. But the, the point is, is that, you know, we have to remember that they have crossed several safe countries to get to the UK and, and they are abusing the, the, the privilege that has been offered to them. And so, you know, it, do, it deals work both ways, Sheila. They don't work in ways that um, I, I, I take all and I give you nothing. All right, James. Thank you, James, in Manchester. Chris has called from Wakefield. Hi, Chris. Hi. We shouldn't be giving anything? No, absolutely not. Um, I think the money... The, th the thing is, France has got us over a barrel with the Latouke Treaty, and I think the money would be better spent fixing the system rather than throwing it into Calais. What system? I think the, the reason, um, and through no fault of the migrants own. I mean, let's face it, if we were coming from a poor country, we'd want to go to the place where we got the best benefits, um, which is us, ultimately. Um, so, and that's the the opinion that they've got, that they come to Britain and, and the streets are paved with gold. Um, and I think the system is broken. I, I mean, let's face it, who wouldn't want to come to a fantastic place like London or Manchester, great cities, um, or even Leeds or Wakefield for that matter? But um, I think the, the, the thing is, it, the, if the word got back to these places that actually if you come to Britain, um, you don't get to go and to the West End of London and, and enjoy the benefits of that, you actually get moved to places where we need them populating um, or places that are sparsely populated. Places like St Kilda, unpopulated, remote, um, windy. Last some, by well, eight mile an hour gales. <laughs> some people have gone to remote if, places, but not many. You're I, probably right. I don't know if Britain would be such an attractive place if we if we helped um, the asylum seekers out by putting them in places like that. Well, I'm not sure the people of St Kilda would uh, welcome your analogy, but I, I take your point, Chris. Thank you, Chris, in Wakefield. Uh, James has called from Barnes to carry on. We've got five minutes before the news at three. Carry on our conversation about Calais and this deal that's expected to be announced around five when Theresa May um, and uh, Emmanuel Macron, the President of France, um, uh, give speeches um, on, amongst other things, security around Calais. James, uh, do you think we have a choice here? Uh, well, Sheila, you know... I'm just absolutely sick and tired of all the namby-pamby talk that goes on about um, uh, 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 illegal, illegal entries. Illegal, it's, the answer is in the word illegal. And I think that these people spoil the whole thing for pu tru truly deserving cases. And I think it's about time that we, that we looked at this in a moral sense. And the moral term is that, you know, they're no better, their morals are no better than somebody who breaks into somebody's house. And they should be treated accordingly. Yeah, the thing is that there is something in it for us, isn't there, James? What, illegal immigrants? No, in, in, no in, in the security factor. How do you... Uh, in, in paying to help no, France no, secure no, that no, situation. No, France, it's France's responsibility. They come in, as people have said, across, across the continent. They gave in the first port of entry, entry of, a, of a European country. They can, you know, if, got, if they are, are, have legal qualifications, then they can be granted asylum. If not, they should be turned back at that point, there and then. And we shouldn't go picking up people. We should be working hard on the, on the, on the North African coast to stop any of this stuff starting. You know, we need to help people in their countries. I, I do believe in all that. And in fact, if we stay, if we actually get out of the EU, we can start helping, helping certainly the African countries and more undeveloped countries by better trade with them, because the tariffs of the mm. EU are absolutely crucify them. And, and we already are helping them um, in, in aid, um, and it's worth hey, you know, the, it's yeah, worth yeah. reminding people of that. Yeah, we want to be able to them to be sustaining their countries, not aid. Aid, aid is, is just like benefits. You know, it doesn't help anybody in the long run. It helps them in the short run. But the long run, people need to be able to develop themselves, and that's where we need to help them. Okay, thank you, James, for your call. James in Barnes. Let's finish with Dave in Uxbridge. Hi, Dave. 
Hi, Sheila. Um, kind of what the, uh, the previous caller was saying, that we need to start taking a harder line. Um, this country's always been welcoming for refugees, but it's gone beyond the power now. And um, France in particular, they turn a blind eye to these refugees. And as far as they're concerned, they're Britain's problem. They're just keeping them there until they eventually creep into the country. And our threat should be, OK, we'll move a hard border back to Dover. The European Union have already said that they don't want to trade with us or they don't want to trade deal with us. So part of the conditions are we move it back to Dover. We examine every vehicle that comes through Dover. We'll have to employ more customs or some customs officers now because we haven't got any. And um, every illegal immigrant or asylum seeker we find who's come from France, for example, just turn them back. Um, the Wouldn't that, that, what you've just described sounds more costly to make to echo the point that one of my previous callers made. That sounds more costly than giving the French 40 million um, and getting them to do it or doing it with them on that side of the border. What you've just described sounds more costly, seems to me. Thank you, though, Dave, for your call, David Oxbridge. But I, I need to know a little bit more about the whys before we do the whats. Five million quid means that five million pounds worth of NHS expertise... Um, it backs homeopathy, I think. I could be reading it wrong. Mike's in Marlowe. Mike, what would you like to say? Jacob. Is Mike, is Mike there? 24 minutes after 11. It doesn't matter. As long as there is a tiny, tiny, tiny part of Mike on the line, um, diluted to the power of about 10 million, then I can continue the conversation with him under the under the uh, rules and regulations, the principles of homeopathy. Um, if you know why £5 million worth of public money is spent every year on sending patients to homeopathic hospitals, I'd love to hear from you. And my sort of example of the holy water and the baby born with a club foot is, is not silly. I, I do mean it. The uh, simple state of affairs is that people believe in something and occasionally the thing that they believe in actually happens. You will never persuade them. It's like the, the crutches and the um, wheelchairs abandoned at, at the pilgrimage site of Lourdes in France. You'll never persuade them that there isn't a link between the two things. And it's, it's, it's unkind to try to. So that's why we're focusing on the public money question. Uh, Mike is in Marlowe. Mike, what would you like to say? Yeah, good morning, James. I've been dying to get on this one with you. Um, my wife's a homeopath. I've, I've got friends that are homeopaths. I've been using it pretty much all my life. I don't even know my doctor's name. That's how effective it is. Yeah, um, you should probably find out in case you ever get poorly. <laughs> but that's the point. There's six and a half million people, James, that mm. use alternative medicine every year, and you're up and on about five million quid's worth of drugs it doesn't even compare well, no, there's That's no drugs involved of the population there's no drugs involved is there well it's all right uh, remedies let's let's get no the i think i think this is people. treatment i think if there's a homeopathic hospital that five million quid is going to be spent on everything from the heating bills to, yeah. to, yeah, to well, i'm not sure i don't know actually i don't know enough about it no. but but i mean it, what would you do if you got... Forgive me, Mike, but I, i'm going to ask you a couple of robust questions if that's okay yeah yeah yeah, yeah of course what would you do if you got cancer I would seek the appropriate treatment. Right, so make sure you find out your doctor's name and get registered Sharpish, all right? Well, not necessarily, not necessarily. Oh, you mean the appropriate treatment it, might, might not be medicine? It might not be, no. No, it could be all sorts of things. Okay. But, but that's the point, you see. If you've got this closed mind on everything, then... Uh, then nothing's going nothing's to gonna sway you. But the point is... Well, no, of course something's going to sway me, Mike. Uh, Peer-reviewed peer evidence will sway me. Well, listen, well, our six and a half million people, why do they use alternative medicine? Yeah, but that's not peer-reviewed medicine, that's um, anecdote. No, it's not anecdote, James, it's facts. No, no, it's no, it's, fact the, the, the six and a half million people use alternative medicine, now you prove that it's cured anything. That, that's where the facts come in. Of course it in. has. I mean, listen, I had an ingrown toenail. I mean, it sorted that out. I mean, I mean there's, there's all... Uh, Pardon? Fun things that will sort out an ingrown what do you, what do you take for, What do you take for an ingrown toenail? Either, either magnetic north or magnetic south, depending on which toe it is. Which foot it is. You see, now now that's really going to throw you, isn't it? Well, no, it's the opposite. <laughs> I'll tell you what you have done. What? You've persuaded me completely that it has to be banned. No, nonsense. But you're, mate, you're going to get into all sorts of bother with these beliefs. I'm not in any sorts of bother. No, I'm not, not, years not, old. not I'm yet. I'm absolute rude health. Yeah, and, but and well, if, if you I get really, really wrong, poorly and you try and cure it with... I don't know, voodoo. No, I'm, go no, I'm going to miss you, Mike. No, 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 no. You I'm going to really miss you, Mike. Terminology. Yeah. <laughs> Listen, I ain't going anywhere, Mike. All right, and what are your... Um, what are terminology, your, James. How long did yeah, your wife study to, to, become, to become a homeopath? 
Sorry? How, how long did your wife study to become a homeopath? Oh, years and years and years. Oh, well, how many years and years and years? Oh, I, I can't remember. I don't know. Four or five years, something like, like full -time that. Full-time study? And, and, yeah. For, where did yeah. she go? And then, the, and then no, no, James, listen, don't, do not poo-poo it. I think you need to read up on it. If, and you if, need to change can I, can I poo-poo it if I use a tiny, tiny, tiny bit of poo diluted to a million parts well, of water? Well, you go, you see, this is, this is part of your rhetoric, this tiny, tiny... Well, it's homeopathy, Mike! There's no peer-reviewed evidence for it at all. There I, I, is, James. There is, James. You need to read into this okay. before you start slagging it off again. Honestly, oh, mate, all you right, need to mate. read into well, it. What should I read first? I don't know. I'm not the homeopath, but there are plenty, there's plenty of studies well, done. what did you there's read, plenty then? plenty of reasons why... What did you read that persuaded you it's the real deal? I don't need to read anything, mate. I've got a... I, my my right. wife and friends of mine are, are homeopaths, and they're so, all... So, if I, so if, I, if I read something, then I'd be as persuaded as you are that it works, but you haven't read no, anything, I... and you can't recommend anything to me to read. No, I've got 20 years of, of using home, homeopathy and not going to my GP. Surely that's evidence enough, isn't it? Oh, mate. Did you vote Brexit? No, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> Have a great weekend, Mike, really. Because that's, <laughs> that's evidence. No, it's not blinking evidence. That just means you haven't been poorly for 20 years. Ah, oh, dear. Jeremy is in Wimbledon. Jeremy, what would you like to say? I would like to say that homeopathy does work. But I wish it could be called complementary medicine rather than alternative. It's not a matter of either or. There is a place for allopathic regular medicine. This would be Prince Charles's position, I think, wouldn't it? Probably. Mm. Probably. But I know from my own situation, it, it works for me. It worked. My wife, for instance, my wife had a, a serious surgery. Yes. I said to the surgeon, do you mind if she takes some homeopathic remedies. He says, no, no, whatever, whatever. Um, she took some remedies uh, which help prepare the body for the traumatic shock of having a bloody great knife stuck in it. And <laughs> yes. Um, she was in the Portman Women's Hospital. Mm. The nurses could not believe how she recovered so promptly. We mentioned this, they mentioned it to the surgeon who said, oh, I must be a better surgeon than I thought. Anyway, a friend of ours' wife was going in to have a similar, the same operation. And I said, listen, you don't believe in it, you don't need to believe in it, but here are some little thingies, yes. take these and see what happens. They were stunned and amazed at how well she did. And he said, listen, mate, I've got to pay you. I said, look, it doesn't, honestly, it's a gift. It's only 370 anyway. <laughs> he said, look, I've only got 150 quid. He said, I've got 150 quid on me at the moment. I'll give you the rest later. I said, no, three pounds. <laughs> <laughs> None of this proves that it works, but it does prove well, that, that it probably shouldn't be banned. It's complementary, not alternative. It's not really, no, but it's not really medicine, Jeremy, despite your experiences. I don't know what it is, then. It's, well, it's, remedy. it's a placebo. It, 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 it works on the mind, the belief. You're, just the belief that it's going to work obviously kind of creates some sort of environment that, that you'd be more relaxed, you'd just be more uh, one with the world. It's, it's a weird one. It is like religion. Religion makes you feel better. So does homeopathy. Mm -hmm. No, do you know what? I've broken lots of bones. <laughs> Homeopathy does not mend bones. Right, on that we will agree. Are you a Led Zeppelin fan? Uh, I work, worked in a recording studio in Holland with them at one point. Yes, I met. I spent several days with them and the Rolling Stones. I was doing voiceovers for something, and uh, Led Zeppelin and the Rolling Stones were in the next studio. Well, I'll tell really you... Really nice but, but people. Do you want the good news or the bad news? What's the bad news? The bad news is that, um, I've forgotten what the bad news is. They've probably forgotten me entirely. No, I was going to say something about asking facetious questions and not knowing what the answer would be. That, that was it, yeah. The, the, the bad news is that I just asked you a facetious question thinking I was being clever and you made me look like a complete muppet. The good news is that that's one of the best answers to a question that I've ever had on the programme. Oh, good. <laughs> Have a cracking weekend, Jeremy. <laughs> and you. <laughs>
It's 11.46. I love this. it. Well, from the Russia investigations to slamming the president as a divisive figure, the world has been consumed with Trump over the last year. Exactly one year ago, he was sworn in as the 45th commander-in-chief for the US. But how are those people who voted for him feeling now? LBC's Connor Gillis has travelled to one of the Rust Belt states which ripped up the rule book and voted Republican for the first time in decades. Tuned to 89.7. Welcome to Wisconsin, the famous industrial Midwest, seen as the incubator of the Trump phenomenon. This is the place that nudged the Donald across the winning line. Hi, sir. I'm good. How are you? Where are you headed for? I'm going to Waukesha, downtown Waukesha. Jesus Christ, that's a ride. Holy cow. One year on, I've set off to test the climate with the people that brought Trump to power. We put our uh, other cor- foreign countries... You put them in line, they no longer think we're a joke. It doesn't take any crap. What about the comment the other day he said about African countries? Never said it, period. No more fake news. He's on tape admitting to sexual assault. Oh, really? Because I don't believe him. Do you see the women that, that, that came forward? Did you see how ugly they were compared to the women that he's been married to? Give me a break. Have a cup of coffee. Here in the town of Waukesha, fans say Trump is restoring the U.S. to the truly great country it once was. And I know there's a lot of controversy right now about some things that he said. Uh, what do you make of those? And I've been to Africa. It is <laughs> um, I just feel that it's been really great with the industry that's coming back to the U.S. Um, being somebody that worked in manufacturing for many years, I lost my job many years ago to all the jobs getting shipped overseas. <laughs> And that's the unmistakable message from the blue-collar workers on the factory floors and the farms here. They don't care about what Trump says. For them, it's all about jobs and the economy. I think he just wants to keep the riffraff away from here. He's trying to make our country great again. And has he over the last year? He's getting there, little by little. And he tried to get rid of Obamacare and build a wall, but he hasn't achieved that yet. It's only been a year, dude. Give him a chance. It's great. He'll do it in his time. time. So this is the state hailed as the very model of Trump's Rust Belt Rebellion. There's a feeling the president can do no wrong, but he still needs to deliver on those big key promises, or he'll be pulled under by the same wave that brought him to the White House. LBC's Conor Gillis reporting there. Um, He's certainly a president who you can say there's no shades of grey about. You either love him or you hate him. And you either think he's the greatest president that's ever walked this earth or you think he's the worst president in American history. And right, let's crack on with your calls. David's in Bromley. Hello, David. Hi, good evening. Hi. Hi. Right, Donald Trump, fantastic. Um, He restored my... my uh, I don't know. Basically, I lost a lot of hope in America through the through the uh, candidate for the election time, you know, with Hillary Clinton and so on. Yeah. All those re- revelations coming out and just seeing how corrupt the previous go- governments were, how corrupt the Clintons were. And I thought, wow, is this what it's about? This is America that I thought that was a great country and stuff. You know, run by a bunch of crooks, basically, who suck up, say one thing and do another. With Donald Trump, he doesn't say everything you like, but at least he delivers what he says. And I think that's the that's first number one credential for any leader of any country. Finally, we've got a, uh, you know, a leader of a country who actually does what he says he's going to do. Yeah, in, in some ways you're right. But what, what if he delivers the things that he said he was going to do, but they're, they're actually rather distasteful things, like well, uh, the, the, the uh, ban on Muslims from various countries, the wall? I mean, you don't seriously agree with either of those, do you? Um, okay. You look at it from his point of view. I, I, I agree with what he, I don't agree with what you just said, no, because a, a ban, of course not. However, he said it's a temporary ban, didn't he? Well, we see what to do. So he's trying to say, we need to get a hold of this. We can't afford any more sort of um, problems. And obviously, um, as we know, you know, the majority of terrorism comes from uh, the, the same religion. So he has to deal with that temporarily for people coming in so they can look at what's happening in that country. But leaving that aside, because uh, you know, he's then got the fact that he's restored a relationship with Israel again, which Obama almost demolished, which is ridiculous. So, you know, a Democrat... It's a slight, ex- slight exaggeration, Israel. but I hear what you say. Well, he, OK. He made, he made Jerusalem the capital, which it should have been all along. Fantastic. Um, he's, but, but, uh, but a sorry, huge sorry, risk but, to peace in the Middle East by doing that. <laughs> it was a false peace to think that there was any peace before. Look... What you've got with uh, Donald Trump, he's achieved and signed off more bills than Obama did in eight years, in one year. Now, that's fantastic. At the Uh, end of his... Has he? Really? Yes. Are you sure? In one year. 
Yeah, in fact, he's only got one piece yet. of legislation through the tax reform. Yeah, you know those things that he signs at his desk and holds them up and everyone takes photos. Those uh, things. Well, they were exa- they, no, 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 no. They weren't bills. They were executive orders. Yeah. Okay. That, right. Fine. So he signed off more of those. That's what I mean. He, he's basically said, "Right, let's get on with it." So that's good. Another thing. He ended the cabinet. He ended the year 2017 with a cabinet meeting. And what happened on that day? The the uh, the, the the stock exchange or whatever they call it over there, Nasdaq and all that stuff. It was at its highest it's ever been ever. And what happened in, in London the day after? Ours came to the, uh, you know, uh, went to the highest too. And then you have employment. It went right down. He's he's bringing. I mean, this is good for Americans, not so good for the rest of the world. But he's bringing back a great great economy. Uh, you know, manufacturing and everything in this country, which obviously will have a rebound because they're our allies. Um, he's he's also bumping up the amount of. Um, uh, military, which is good, hopefully just to s- stop any sort of random acts from uh, North Korea, uh, Russia, China. He's also doing pretty good trade with China things. And he's saying, look, if you want to trade, then you'll have to trade on decent terms, not stupid trades. And, you know, I, I quite like to bomb as a person, family man, good example of all of that sort of things. He spoke well, but he didn't do anything. So basically, people like to bomb because he didn't do anything. They don't like Trump because he is doing stuff. He's not, he's not a politician. He doesn't, he's not a Democrat either. He's a he's a businessman, but he's he's delivering, and I think that's fantastic. And personally, as a Christian, fantastic too. You know, he's, he's seriously up as a Christian, you think that he's yeah. been a fantastic president. The morality of the man stinks. Well, he's anti-abortion. He's pro-life, which is good. He's pro-family, good. He's pro-Christmas, good. <laughs> he's he's pro. pro he's pro. He's pro-family. He's had three of them. No, he stands. I'm talking about no. Don't don't judge, judge by what he's trying to do for the country, not what he's done. Yeah, he's made mistakes. Obviously, he's he's not a great person. He's made mistakes. You see, I, 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 I thought you'd, you'd actually put quite a good case for him up until that point. But I don't know how, well, as a no, Christian, yeah, you can not, say that he's he's been a good president. The church in this country are generally pro pro Trump because he stands for a lot of Christian principles that we believe in. He also believes oh that uh, America should be Christian, Christian country. Yes, well, what's wrong with that? Seriously, they were founded. You think he's a, you, well, what Christian values do you think he embodies? Tolerance, life, pro life, anti abortion. So he believes in. Well, the, I've seen I've, I've I've seen no evidence of that at all. Yes, he t- he said to any country that funds that does uh, that funds um, uh, abortion, he's not going to send. Uh, uh, aid to, so that was one thing he did. He also knocked on the head all the funding, public funding, to all the abortion clinics. He's introduced all his uh, uh, the guys in charge of all the courts and so on that they're all anti, uh, they're all anti-abortion too. That's good. Okay, so at least wow. babies have a life. I mean, okay. it's a good cho- well, it's a good chance that it's a good um, it's a good thing that no one else, you know, pro-abortion obviously it wasn't enforced with them, others wouldn't exist. So we've got to be pro pro that pro marriage, pro family. Fantastic. And he said, Happy Christmas, and he believed in bringing Christmas back. And the first thing he did oh, when he went right, to the White House, on day one, he turned off, he turned off the, the bleeps in, in the White House, didn't he? That called wisdoms to prayer in the White House. And you think that's that, the first that, thing he did. And, and that's, that's a great thing, is it? So. Well, that was something that Obama introduced, and it's something he turned off the first thing he did on day one. Well, that tells you, uh, you see, and, that tells me quite a lot about his priorities. And if that's really the first thing he did on day one, Dear, oh dear, oh dear. Um, David, thank you very much. Nigel is in King's Cross. Uh, Nigel, what's your verdict? Uh, I actually agree with uh, what Christian said about uh, about Obama doing nothing and he's loved and Trump's actually doing something and he's hated. I think that's largely to do with the media. Um, they're influencing uh, you know, public perception on every action that Trump makes. Uh, the, tax re- uh, the tax reform is a perfect example where you know, he's helped bring two and a half trillion dollars of offshore earnings that wasn't taxed and has just been sitting outside of the US to avoid being taxed. He's brought that back onto US soil and pumped into the and injected into the economy. And yet everyone's just focusing on his tweets instead of focusing on the good things and the economic. But, but that's his fault, isn't it? Because if he, well, t- if he tweets such utter, utterly ridiculous things, uh, can anybody be blamed for commenting on them? Well, I think that that's been one thing which has been consistent. And what the media's job is to do is to weight what's important and what's not. And a lot of the tweets that he makes are not important, and they shouldn't be reporting them. That should just well, the, me- the media's job is to report what he does, what he says, report the facts, and people can draw, draw their own conclusions. Well, I feel that they don't do that for Obama, because, like, his legacy is Trump. So his eight years in office led to such a rich call gap that people were desperate. They were so desperate that they voted for Trump. 
OK, Nigel, quickly to Dina. Dina, you're in Maida Vale. You've got 45 seconds, I'm afraid. Um, Ian, the greatest thing, I think, of his presidency is he's given us a platform in which to question the Liberal agenda. Whether you approve of it or not, he has made this possible that we do know we no longer just believe what the press tells us. Did you ever? Um, yeah, I did, actually. Did you really? I've got Andrew Pearce from the Daily Mail opposite me. Did you ever believe a word he writes? <laughs> Are you, are you talking to me or someone from the Daily Mail? Sorry. I'm talking to you. Oh, yeah. No, um, I, I've never believed exactly what the Daily Mail writes, but what I really <laughs> believe is that, um, that, there, that we talk the newspapers and politics a lot more seriously. Well, than I, I, I'm not sure we did. But anyway, we've unfortunately run out of time. Dina, thank you very much for that. Now, in the United States, the government is lurching towards a financial shutdown unless a last-minute deal can be reached. The chaos on Capitol Hill is perhaps a fitting metaphor for Donald Trump's first year in office, a year which has seen controversy after controversy, some broken promises, but other ones delivered. His approval rating is at an historic low, but the economy is growing strongly and his own supporters remain loyal. Today, he's been out rallying the faithful at an anti-abortion parade. Porrick O'Brien is there. Cathy, we're at Constitution Avenue at a giant anti-abortion rally. Uh, it's interesting talking to the people here in terms of their assessment of the last 12 months of Donald Trump. What's their take on it? These are Bible folk, remember. Their take turned to Matthew chapter 7, 7, verse 16. By their deeds you shall know them, not by their tweets you shall know them. And I say that because the people here say that Donald Trump is delivering for them on what they elected him to do. Robust immigration reform, tax reform, and, of course, that crucial appointment to the Supreme Court last year. Here's a flavour of sentiment here on the ground. Tomorrow will mark exactly one year since I took the oath of office. And I will say our country is doing really well. Our economy is perhaps the best it's ever been. What's your assessment of his 12 months in office I so far? I think he's doing a great job. I hope it continues till yes. the second term. Where have you come from today? From Long Beach, Long Island. What's your assessment? I think he's doing a really good job. I think he uh, stands up for the country and doing the right thing, and he's pro-life. That's the main thing. He's Is that the main thing for you, yeah? Well, it's one of the main things, yes. Yeah. People might be offended by some of his words, but what he, what he does and what, what, how the country's doing, he's doing a, a good job. We're from Bucyrus, Ohio. What's your assessment of his 12 months so far? Yay! I think he's doing well. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. Why are you so excited about it? Because he's doing what he said he would do, and yeah. he's not backing down to the Democrats. I see. He's, he's standing for what he believes, and I think that's really good. Is there anything that he's done that you do not like? No, nothing. He walks on water, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> he walks on water? As far as I'm concerned. <laughs> So, what of the next 12 months? I think it's worth keeping an eye on two main themes that could end up defining the next 12 months. Number one, I know we've said it before, but the Robert Mueller investigation, and in particular, how that is examining uh, Russian money laundering, alleged Russian, Russian money laundering. And the second one I think is interesting is going to be the role of women, particularly in the midterm elections come November. Not just women voters, but there are record numbers of women running for office in that midterms. And that could redefine the political dynamic here. Tomorrow on the streets behind me, the giant women's march will take place. And it's worth noting that this time last year, when that women's march took place here, it was the biggest in US history. Horik, thank you very much. Well, joining me now from New York is former economic advisor to Donald Trump, Betsy McCoy. Ms. McCoy, we saw the anti-abortion rally today. It was quite a divisive decision, perhaps, for President Trump to turn up. But, I mean, that's how he's run this president, he, president, presidency. He divided America when he was elected, and those divisions have deepened since, haven't they? Well, actually, most Americans support Donald Trump's position, although the United States is divided between pro-choice and pro-life advocates roughly equally. Americans are overwhelmingly against partial birth abortion, late-term abortion, inflicting abortion on pre-born babies who are capable of 
feeling pain and of course killing children who infants who are born alive despite the efforts at abortion and he has supported all those legislative efforts to stop those extreme versions of abortion right so i think when you see him out there on the street today he, he has most Americans behind him. Okay, but how do you think I some of the Christians... I have to woman, uh, but I, I sympathize with his views on those particular issues. Yeah, I understand. I mean, how do you think some of the Christian right, who no doubt were at that rally today, how do you think they view a president who's joked about sexually assaulting women, allegations of, allegations of an affair with a, a porn star, allegations he denies, but how, how does the Christian right view that? How do you view that? Well... Well, they, m most uh, uh, evangelicals and Catholics who voted overwhelmingly for Donald Trump kind of wave aside a lot of this as media hype, which it is. The fact is they're looking at what he does, not what the media say about him. Uh, and that will explain, for example, uh, their enthusiasm because although the media say he's not doing a good job, the United States economy is at its absolute all-time peak. The stock market has gone up 40% this year and since his election, and that actually makes almost all Americans richer, not just wealthy people, right. but every union worker, every retiree who depends on a pension is 40% richer now. And when they get their paychecks in February, they will see that the recently enacted tax cut also means more take-home pay for them. Okay, so I'm so, predicting that these midterm elections coming next November will be a big surprise for those who are predicting a democratic route. So why do you think his approval ratings are the lowest in history then for this stage in a presidency? Well, because the media coverage, which I would categorize as shamefully biased, uh, has influenced public opinion. But now the public, particularly working people, to whom he has addressed his campaign from the beginning, working people are feeling the tangible results of his economic policies. And let me put forward another, another one. The United States wants energy independence. Coal production is up 12% this year. This year, the United States will produce more oil than Saudi Arabia. These are the kinds of tangible accomplishments that will be reflected at the polls next November. But are you, are you concerned at all on, an in, on the international stage that he's firing off tweets about the size of Kim Jong-un's nuclear button? He's making the world a more precarious place. Do you c worry about that? I wouldn't say he's making the world a more precarious place. The tweets are unnerving to some people. Those of us who have been in politics a long time kind of ignore all of that background noise. The fact is he has diminished the ISIS forces in Iraq from 45,000 fighters to 1,000 in a year. That military accomplishment has made a broad swathe of the Middle East much safer, including Christians, by the way. Betsy McCoy, thank you very much for joining us. Bye now.